Preface of The Two Paths This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Packard The Two Paths by John Ruskin Preface The following addresses, though spoken at different times, are intentionally connected in subject, their aim being to set one or two main principles of art in simple light before the general student and to indicate their practical bearing on modern design. The law which it has been my effort chiefly to illustrate is the dependence of all noble design in any kind on the sculpture or painting of organic form. This is the vital law lying at the root of all that I have ever tried to teach respecting architecture or any other art. It is also the law most generally disallowed. I believe this must be so in every subject. We are all of us willing enough to accept dead truths, or blunt ones, which can be fitted harmlessly into spare niches, or shrouded and coffined at once out of the way. We hold complacently the cemetery keys, and supposing we have learned something. But a sapling truth, with earth at its root and blossom on its branches, or a trenchant truth, which can cut its way through bars and sods, most men, it seems to me, dislike the sight or entertainment of, if by any means such a guest or vision may be avoided. And, indeed, there is no wonder, for one such truth, thoroughly accepted, connects itself strangely with others and there is no saying where it may lead us to. And thus the gist of what I have tried to teach about architecture has been throughout denied by my architect readers, even when they thought what I said suggestive in other particulars. Quote, Anything but that. Study Italian Gothic? Perhaps it would be as well. Build with pointed arches? There's no objection. Use solid stone and well-burnt brick? by all means. But learn to carve or paint organic forms ourselves? How can such a thing be asked? We are above all that. The carvers and painters are our servants, quite subordinate people. They ought to be glad if we leave room for them." End quote. Well, on all that it turns. For those who will not learn to carve or paint, and think themselves greater men because they cannot, it is wholly wasted time to read any words of mine. In the truest and sternest sense, they can read no words of mine, for the most familiar I can use, form, proportion, beauty, curvature, color, are used in a sense which by no effort I can communicate to such readers, and in no building that I praise is the thing that I praise it for visible to them and it is more necessary for me to state this fully, because so-called Gothic or Romanesque buildings are now rising every day around us, which might be supposed by the public more or less to embody the principles of those styles, but which embody not one of them, nor any shadow or fragment of them, but merely serve to caricature the noble buildings of past ages, and to bring their form into dishonor by leaving out their soul. The following addresses are therefore arranged, as I have just stated, to put this great law, and one or two collateral ones, in less mistakable light, securing even in this irregular form at least clearness of assertion. For the rest, the question at issue is not one to be decided by argument, but by experiment, which if the reader is disinclined to make, all demonstration must be useless to him. The lectures are for the most part printed as they were read, mending only obscure sentences here and there. The parts which were trusted to extemporary speaking are supplied, as well as I can remember, only with the addition here and there of things I forgot to say, in the words, or at least the kinds of words, used at the time, and they contain, in all events, the substance of what I said more accurately than hurried general reports. I must beg my readers not in general to trust to such, 
for even in fast speaking I try to use words carefully, and any alteration of expression will sometimes involve a great alteration in meaning. A little while ago I had to speak of an architectural design and called it elegant, meaning founded on good and well elected models. The print report gave excellent design, that is to say, design excellingly good, which I did not mean, and should even in the most hurried speaking never have said. The illustrations of the lecture on iron were sketches made too roughly to be engraved, yet too elaborate subjects to allow of my drawing them completely. Those now substituted will, however, answer the purpose nearly as well, and are more directly connected with the subjects of the preceding lectures, so that I hope, throughout the volume, the student will perceive an insistence upon one main truth, nor lose, in any minor direction of inquiry, the sense of the responsibility which the acceptance of that truth fastens upon him, responsibility for choice, decisive and conclusive between two modes of study, which involve ultimately the development or deadening of every power he possesses. I have tried to hold the choice clearly out to him, and to unveil for him, to its farthest, the issue of his turning to the right hand or the left. Guides he may find many, and aids many, but all these will be in vain, unless he has first recognized the hour and the point of life when the way divides itself, one way leading to the olive mountains, one to the vale of the salt sea. There are few crossroads that I know of, from one to the other. Let him pause at the parting of the two paths. The two paths being lectures on art and its application to decoration and manufacture, delivered in 1858 and 9. End of preface. Recording by Michael Packard.